I want to welcome you to First Universal Universalist Church of Denver. My name is Tom Abood. I'm a member of the church here, also a member of our Green First Task Force, and also a member of our Endowment Fund Committee. So tonight is great because I think all of us are looking at how we can go with clean energy now. And there's great opportunities to talk about. And we're also going to talk about what we did here at First Universalist Church starting in 2015, pretty much ending in 2018 with all the renovations and the geothermal and the solar we did and how we did it without any federal direct payments that we do now have under the Inflation Reduction Act. So we, we have some uh, great folks here and we're really honored because we have uh, Representative Meg Froelich who represent Colorado House District 3, and she's going to say a few words for us right now. So come on up, Meg. Yep. <laughs> You're going to lead us off. Well, thank you so much, and thank you all for being here. This is, this is something to take time out on an evening, so I really, really appreciate your commitment. I am uh, Meg Froelich. I represent House District 3, which is basically here. Um, and south of Hamden. So it's Cherry Hills, Englewood, and Sheridan, and then the sliver of Denver south of Hamden. So we're right in my sweet spot, although I don't think I actually physically rep Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, maybe this corner isn't in mine. But um, I serve on the Energy and Environment Committee, and I also chair Transportation, Housing, and Local Government. And so I really like those two committees for the synergy that it represents, particularly as we face what are really two of our biggest challenges, which is addressing climate change and addressing our housing crisis um, and all the ways in which transportation and, um, and energy and environment intersect. So um, I'm particularly excited that you have gathered to address this climate crisis and what communities of faith can do. I am a woman of faith. It, when I attend church, I go to First Plymouth across the street, um, but I'm a very uh, s slack church goer. I got really used to going in my pajamas during COVID, and I haven't quite broken the habit, and so I often attend online. Um, but I also, um, when I used to run the Colorado Institute for Leadership Training, and we did a, when we did our section on the environment, we always had um, folks addressing this intersection of faith and, um, and our stewardship of the planet. And um, I think there's just a beautiful harmony um, in those philosophies. Um, and then just from the secular standpoint, um, I'm sure you know that our governor has created um, a depart across every department a greenhouse gas emissions reduction roadmap, um, which we wish was had more maybe penalty in it, but at the moment it is um, it is mostly based on incentives um, and holding uh, folks accountable. But it goes sector by sector um, and sets goals at strategic ways along the calendar. Um, and it's going to be really, really difficult to meet those goals. And it's going to take all kinds of people stepping up, even folks that aren't specifically targeted in the greenhouse uh, gas reductions roadmap. Um, we also have, at the same time, an extreme heat task force that the governor has convened that's looking at um, why our climate is heating up at this tre tremendous rate. Um, there, I serve on the ozone committee that's looking at ozone and our non-compliance and our brown cloud that we've been out of compliance with. And they're all intersected, of course. And the key, key factor in, in getting there, um, getting to a livable planet, passing on uh, something that we can be proud of to the next generation, who are holding us accountable as they should, um, is energy and, and weaning ourselves from fossil fuels, of course. And that, and the other big surprise, or surprise emitter, um, which is shocking to people who first see that pie chart of where our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from, are our buildings. And so by 
going through this process and, and accessing these IRA dollars um, wherever we can across every sector um, is such a critical piece. Uh, I'm, I'm running legislation that's going to be addressing local governments, climate action plans, um, and land use, and those factors. So we want our local governments participating, and the opportunity for communities of faith, which end up PS being property owners and possessors of buildings, um, uh, could be just such an important piece of the puzzle. So I'm so grateful that you're here tonight, that your willingness to to learn from what is already happening and imagine what could happen, and I guess you're even doing more than originally planned, but we also have this moment where we have these federal dollars and we have where we have a federal administration that has acknowledged climate change, that's nice, but put some muscle behind it as well. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna leave a couple of my cards here. It has my cell phone on it. I don't mind being texted. Um, at the during our land use bill fight that uh, Danny was very much aware of, and I'm sure Tom was too. Um, the Cherry Hills sent out a mailing to every resident in Cherry Hills with pictures of Englewood multiplexes saying that this was coming at any moment to Cherry Hills if I, if Meg Froelich had her way, and here's her cell phone number. <laughs> so I said to the mayor, hey, you know, it's like your mother. I can give out my cell phone number, but you can't <laughs> give out my, and she said, well, you give it out all the time. I was like, yes, I give it out all the time. But I do want you to um, contact me if you have any questions, and I'd love to participate in anything that can be a catalyst or urge um, participation from your communities, wh whatever that may be. So thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Meg. And Meg was great during uh, one of our lobby days down at the Capitol. There were about nine or ten of us, and she invited us all into her office, and we had a great discussion that day, so thank you. So, you know, we'll, we'll get into really why we're here, and I want to introduce really the, the driving forces behind here. You know, there's really Danny Katz with Coperg, and that's Colorado, uh, Colorado Public Interest Research Group. Yes, we got it, Coperg, in case you don't know. And then Moshe Kornfeld with, uh, where is Moshe? Okay, over here, who is uh, really the founder and director of Colorado Jewish Climate Action. And then Thomas Weidler, clear in the back, who is the lead organizer with Together Colorado. And they're all going to have a part of this today. So. Uh, what we'd like to do is start off with Moshe really doing an acknowledgement. And I think we need, according to our recorder, we need to stand back here where the light is. So if you could do that, Moshe, that'd be great. Thank you. I, I did write something out. Um, hi, my name is Moshe Kornfeld, and I am the founder and director, as Tom said, of Colorado Jewish Climate Action. I'm also the cantor of Congregation Rodef Shalom, so I have two hats that I wear. Uh, and I just wanted to speak about a few things that are happening right now uh, in the sort of in, in the calendar year and in sort of the news cycle. So one is that Jews are in the midst of the holiday of Sukkot, the festival of booths. Uh, and Sukkot is also known as Chag HaAsif, the holiday of the ingathering, a name that celebrates the end of the yearly agricultural cycles in, in Israel. It's, uh, it, and it's, so it's very much a harvest festival. Uh, and the, har the holiday also marks the beginning of the rainy season. And, and much of the ritual and lit liturgy of the holiday is connected to rain. One of the primary observances of the holiday of Sukkot is dwelling in a sukkah, in a temporary thatch hut that provides shade, but does not provide shelter from rain, heat, or cold. So while the walls can be made out of synthetic materials, the roof must be made from natural materials that grow from the ground. This requirement serves as testimony to our ultimate dependence on nature and reminds us that we, that we would be foolish if we believe that we can have ultimate dominion and mastery over creation. One would think that leaving our comfortable homes 
would make us anxious and perhaps even scared. And yet, on the holiday of Sukkot, we are required to be happy and joyous. Perhaps there's a lesson here for the climate movement. Like the sukkah, the climate, ex the climate crisis exposes us to the elements and to the reality that we are upending the stable earth systems upon which we are dependent. And yet, as we embrace climate action, we must find ways to celebrate. We must celebrate community, our hard-fought wins, and our beautiful, life-sustaining planet. And of course, synagogues, churches, mosques, and other houses of worship must celebrate the new solar panels they will install after hearing about the programs and incentives we are highlighting this evening. <laughs> I want to spend a brief moment talking about Pope Francis, one of my climate heroes. In May of 2015, Pope Francis released Laudatio Si, Praise Be to You, an encyclical that called on all humanity to take bold climate action. I highly recommend that you read this groundbreaking and powerful text if you haven't done so already. Pope Francis, Pro, Pope Francis took his name from St. Francis of Assisi, who famously and almost heretically imagined people as being in spiritual interrelationship with the natural world. In 1967, historian Lynn White wrote, Francis tried to depose man from his monarchy over creation and set up a democracy of all God's creatures. With him, the ant is no longer simply a homily for the lazy. Flames is a sign of the th thrust of the soul towards union with God. Now they are brother ant and sister fire, praising the creator in their own ways, just as brother man does in his. I, appreciate, I deeply appreciate Pope Francis's leadership and hope that we are all inspired by him to cultivate moral leadership and courage to tackle the climate crisis. I mention this today uh, to call your attention to an update to the 2015 encyclical that will be published on Wednesday, this Wednesday, on the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi. So I recommend you find it and read up on this update. In doing this work, we are also inspired by indigenous traditions. Within the indi indigenous spiritual landscape, the natural world is sacralized. Learning from our native brothers and sisters, Western traditions need to reclaim the sense that nature is sacred. As we shed our sense of dominion over nature, it is much more difficult to view nature as an object to be used and abused if we perceive ourselves to be in sacred interrelationship with creation. With this in mind, we recognize that Denver resides on lands that are held in stewardship by the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes. We also acknowledge the other indigenous nations native to Colorado, including the Apache, Comanche, Shoshone, and Ute. Efforts to dispossess indigenous peoples in the service of Western expansion can be viewed as expressions of dominion and mastery traits that continue to haunt us as we careen towards an existential planetary crisis. My sincere hope is that religious leaders like Pope Francis and those here with us tonight can help us unlearn our tendency to view nature as merely an object. It is an honor to be here. I'm eager to learn more about this beautiful, sustainable, spiritual home. This building and congregation should inspire us to continue all should it inspire us all to continue pursuing tikkun olam, the repair our world so needs. Thank you. Great words. So we're going to, the agenda basically is Milt Hetrick and I are going to now do an overview of what we've done at First Universalist and how we financed it. And then Danny will take the stage and give everybody an idea of what is out there for federal direct payments and grants. And then Thomas Weiler, and also talk a little bit about Coburg. And then Thomas Weiler will close, give a little bit of information about Together Colorado. And, and then we'll have questions and answers. So we'll save the questions and answers 
till the end so we have a flow, okay? So uh, Milt Hetrick has been a longtime member of the church and a longtime member of our Green First Task Force, which is our green team. And uh, this all wouldn't have happened without our Green First Task Force. And we'll get into a little more information on that. But Milt has put together an incredible history and has books available. Uh, how many pages is the unabridged? It's, it's 300? I thought it was 700. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, I'll get into that, but I kind of wanted to you all see my T-shirt. And that was, that was part of the campaign. You know, you got to make this fun, and you got to make it visible. And so we had T-shirts printed, basically, about zero carbon for First Universalist Church. And this hat that I'm wearing comes from a slow money conference that I went to a number of years ago. <clears throat> and that had a play into the financing that we'll get involved with here in a bit as well. So want to just give you a little background there, but we basically, it was an all-team all approach. We couldn't have done it without everybody on the Green First Task Force. And we started really in 2015. That's when the plans for what we called the BFF, Building for Our Future, really kicked off. And we completed the entire project by the end of 2018. So 2019 was the first full year that we were in the renovated uh, the premises here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Milt to give you an idea of what we were looking at, what we ended up with, and then I'll jump back in to add basically how did we help finance this because it looked like it wasn't going to happen for a long time. Thanks, Tom. Uh, yes, the um, transition that this church made from fossil fuel to renewable energy was actually embedded in a, a larger renovation program that uh, Tom just mentioned, the BFF renovation program, which was about a four and a half million dollar effort. Um, and we became embedded in it initially, but then when the capital campaign was completed, we found that we didn't have enough money to do all the things that we wanted. So we had to delete some of the effort, including some classrooms and the entire energy system. Our dream of putting solar panels on and getting off of fossil fuel for heating the facility uh, were deleted. However, the Board of Trustees allowed us to s try to find third-party financing to bring the whole system back. So that's one of the things that Tom will be talking about later. But um, basically what we did is we managed to get a Green First team member embedded into the building committee to make sure that the sustainability characteristics that we all, all are advocates of uh, were incorporated into the design specifications for the renovation. So that's something we just, in retrospect, was very important, that we had an insider, so to speak, in this whole project. So um, it turned out that we just went about it in a logical fashion. We looked at how we were spending on our utilities for our electric and natural gas. Uh, in other words, what our Excel bills were. And then use that to define how much solar we would need we were buying from um, Excel. And basically, uh, then size the system for those uh, needs. The, um, the facility did have uh, 10 
gas-fired furnaces throughout this complex. So we decided we wanted to eliminate them and put in ground source heat pumps. And that was a fairly straightforward uh, transition because we were able to just literally take out the furnaces uh, that were the gas burning type and replace them with uh, similarly rated heat pumps. The main cost differential was the fact that you needed some infrastructure, meaning a heat exchanger, which circulates water through the ground underneath the building, basically, and exchanges heat so that in the summertime, the excess heat in the building is put into the ground. And then in the wintertime, um, when the building needs heat, uh, the heat exchanger will provide that, that energy uh, for heating the facility. The ground, as it turns out, we learned, stays around 50, 55 degrees year-round if you get below 10 feet or so. And um, it makes it quite easy then to moderate your, your building temperature at 70 degrees or whatever you want if, if you uh, use the, the thermal energy that's in the ground. So what we have here in our model simply shows a scale that one foot in the model represents 100 feet in real life. So this model is like four feet tall, uh, representing the boreholes that were drilled in a parking lot uh, that would actually go down 400 feet. So there are 12 holes that were drilled. They came out with a drilling rig, and within a week they had the holes drilled. They inserted black plastic pipe um, in the holes, and there's an example of it right here. It's basically a U-tube that allows the water to go down, and it's in contact with the earth, so it's exchanging uh, thermal energy uh, with the earth, and then the water comes back up and circulates into the building. And interestingly enough, this material that it's made out of is called um, high-density polyethylene pipe. And it's used extensively in the oil and gas industry. So thanks to uh, the gas industry, we had the equipment that we needed to put together this heat exchanger and the technology for not just drilling, but uh, they have to thermally bond all these joints and things, and that already existed. <coughs> so um, the uh, system was installed, and there's a funny story about how the first time we used it was on Christmas Eve in 2017. Uh, we had our service, and people flocked into the sanctuary that you'll see later. And it turned out that we hadn't been properly educated on how to use the thermostat. And so by the end of the service, it was about 80 degrees in there because there were a couple, 300 people, and each person is like a 100-watt light bulb. So <laughs> the system worked, but it didn't work in the sense that they didn't have the thermostat set to automatic, which would have allowed it to kick into the cooling mode, which is what we really needed that Christmas Eve. But the system did work. So um, over on that other table in the back, I uh, just wanted to point out that there are some strange looking boxes, little cubes, and um, I don't know, Martin, can I go over there and just explain that real quick? What we did was look at our carbon footprint. And we learned, thanks to the uh, Interfaith Power and Light organization, that um, 
there's such a thing as a congregational footprint. So we knew there was a facility footprint. How much carbon dioxide does the building itself uh, dump into the atmosphere? But there's something else that uh, we'll explain in a minute here. This represents what our carbon footprint was in terms of tons, metric tons of CO2. Each little cube here represents one ton. And before we went to the renovation, um, we had over 100 tons per year that this church was dumping into the atmosphere. That's represented by the black section here. But in addition to that, our congregational footprint included emissions associated with our members driving gasoline cars to our services. And we had to take responsibility for that as a church because if the church didn't exist, those emissions wouldn't occur. The orange down here represents the carbon dioxide uh, from transportation. So that's where we were. And then last year, we took another look at what our carbon footprint looked like, and you can see the building itself had been reduced to these six cubes. The amount of emissions from our cars stayed pretty much the same. We have a few percent of our members who have electric vehicles, but it's just a growing number. It's, it's not that significant yet, but that's part of our challenge as the Green First team is to help educate and incentivize our members to transition to electric vehicles. And then one other little minor feature, so to speak, was the fact that through those doors there, uh, we have a, a nice kitchen. However, it has a natural gas stove and oven. And that uh, ended up being five metric tons of CO2 carbon footprint just uh, because of the kitchen. So what do we do about this? Um, we still have a little bit of electric that we need because we found that in the new facility, the members enjoyed it so much and uh, used it extensively, more so than we thought, or the architect thought we'd be using it, because we hosted conferences and all kinds of meetings we hadn't planned for. So the energy usage went up from what we were used to. So we ended up not having quite enough solar. So we found we needed like phase two. And we're just in the the process of finalizing that, it's going to be roughly another, I'll say $150,000 to add a bit more solar, uh, replace the stove, the gas stove, with an electric stove. And then we found we're also going to need some storage, some battery storage, because if we turn all eight burners on on our stove and have our oven going, ovens going, uh, it'll take our peak demand up above 50 kilowatts, which is where we get put in a different rate schedule, which is more of a commercial time of use schedule that is really expensive. And we, you know, we're talking thousands of dollars probably of increase. So it makes sense to think about investing in uh, storage. So thank goodness um, things have changed from five years ago when we went through phase one. Now we have the <clears throat> Inflation Reduction Act and nonprofits and churches, schools, et cetera, can take advantage um, of this IRA, uh, the direct payments from it, and we're gonna probably be hearing more about that later as well. So I think um, I'll turn it back over to Tom. Okay, turn your camera, Martin.
So the total cost of the geothermal and the solar was $443,000. And that was not included in the budget for the BFF. So it was basically the board was telling us that if we wanted to get this incorporated, we needed to find a way how to finance this. And so we took a look and basically went forward. And we looked around to uh, you know, forming an LLC, getting members who had some money to put into that, but none of them could really take advantage of the tax credits. You had to have passive income, significant passive income, and so that didn't make sense. We looked at a lot of other organizations out there that were putting deals together for churches, the big issue for us was the cost of the geothermal out of that 443000 was 318000 The solar was only 125000 Solar is a lot easier to finance under an LLC and getting the tax credits under the conventional way before the IRA. But we had a big, significant chunk of geothermal to finance that wouldn't, wouldn't make a lot of sense, especially with a loan repayment for the whole thing. So we ended up really going back to the congregation members and looking you know, at our values. What are our principles? What does our faith really say about moving forward here? And we ended up getting donations, additional donations of $208,000 in addition to the BFF that was already around $4 million in donations. But that still left $235,000 for us to really finance in order to get what we wanted for geothermal and solar. So that's where this slow money hat kind of comes into the story. It's, it's all about bringing your money down to earth, divesting out of Wall Street, investing in community, and what better investment could there be than a member of this church making a loan to the church for renewable energy that not only benefits the church short term and long term, but benefits the wider community because we're taking that carbon out of the atmosphere. So we really took a look at, okay, and the board said, well, if you can make this revenue neutral, then we can really maybe make this work. And by revenue neutral, it's basically looking at how much is the church paying for utilities, how much would the loan payments be, and if they're the same, that's revenue neutral. Instead of paying Excel, we're now paying church members. So we rallied a group of our members and we raised the $235,000 and it's a 15 year loan and it's at one and a half percent interest. And I don't think there's a better community investment out there when you take a look at all the dynamics, the impact, the members are getting a return of their principal and some interest. So we were able to put it together based on really looking at our values, aligning this BFF with our principles, and we were able to mobilize the congregation for both donations and loans. And the way we did it to make it easy for the church for the loans is I think there were maybe 12 members who put money in for the 235000 We didn't want the church to have to be making monthly payments to every member, so we put together a special purpose partnership, essentially, aggregated that money, made one loan to the church. The church now pays us one monthly payment. It goes into the partnership account, and at the end of the year, that money's distributed to the lenders, and it's been working great for the last four or five years, and 
we've only got 10 more to go. So, so we wanted to just bring that to those of you who are looking at doing this because you're going to need to finance the 70% or whatever the balance is that you don't get from direct payments and this could be a good opportunity to take a look and really do a combination of donations and member loans to the church in some capacity. Okay? And I think that pretty much will wrap it up for First Universalists and I'd like to turn it over to Danny now to let us all know kind of what we can be looking at here. Thank you. Uh, so again, my name is Danny Katz. I'm the executive director of COPIRG, that's C-O-P-I-R-G, the Colorado Public Interest Research Group. Uh, we're a statewide advocacy organization, and so we are at the state capitol lobbying for good public policy around public interest issues, consumer protection, environment, and health. And um, we have been trying to make sure that people know about the incredible incentives that are out there right now for in both individuals and for entities like places of worship to, to help bend the curve on how expensive some of these green sustainable decisions are so that more people are taking advantage of it. And I think one thing I'm really uh, honored to be here today because you know, it's, it, it's really hard to be the first one to do something. So it's really nice to be able to see and, and hopefully take a tour here in a minute and, and sort of touch what they did here so you can kind of bring that back to your congregations and, and, and houses of worship. Um, the top line opportunity right now is that in the Federal Infra uh, Inflation Reduction Act, there is a 30%, what is oftentimes said is a tax credit, but the way it works is it's a direct payment to uh, places of worship, tax exempt places of worship. What a direct payment means is, let's say we'll use the example we just heard, it's you know, about $120,000 solar panel. Um, you know, a third of that, you know, think about $30,000, $40,000, that can be paid for through federal investment. And normally, if you're tax exempt and it's a tax credit, you're not really eligible for it because you haven't paid the taxes to then get that tax money back. But in this particular case, they're waiving that. So they're basically acting like you paid thirty or forty thousand dollars in taxes, and they're just writing you a check back to you. A direct payment is the the shorthand. So it's not an official tax credit, but as a place of worship, if you invest in a solar system then they give, you get a minimum of 30% of the cost of installation back to you through this direct payment. The couple of details that are really important to know, number one, you have to put the solar installation in place first, so they won't give you the money before you do the solar. Um, and then uh, the second thing is that you can actually boost that 30% so there is a 10% bonus you can get uh, if your place of worship is in what's considered a, a energy community, which is oftentimes a lower income part of a particular city. You can also get a 10% boost if the equipment you use is domestically manufactured. So you can actually get it up to 50% of the cost of the solar panel um, or the solar installation. And so if you were to install that solar uh, installation in let's say 2023, you would then submit the bill, so to speak, to the, the federal government when you file your tax return. And so 2024, if you do it in 2023, it's 2024 when you'd file and you'd get that money back. So you do have to raise the money ahead of time and invest in the system. You don't get that money up front but you do get that money back, and so hopefully that does help make the financing of something like this um, uh, work out better. There are a few other um, things you can take advantage of in this federal tax, um, uh, again, tax credit or direct payment. Uh, geothermal is an option, so there are options to add geothermal. There are also options for what's called combined heat and power. It's not quite a heat pump, but that's another um, uh, um, uh, uh, Thing that you can do in your um, house of worship. And then electric vehicles as well. If you actually own commercial, a commercial vehicle, if it's considered a commercial vehicle that you own, you can apply for $40,000 
for a, um, uh, to a passenger van or a passenger vehicle too. So some places of worship might fall into that category as well. There's no limit to how much money is out there. There's just a limit to how many people are applying. So that's why we're really trying to get this information out. It's not like there's a cap and if you're not the next one in, you might not get it. Everybody who puts in for it uh, will get this money. And so we want to make sure we're getting as much of these dollars into the Colorado community as possible. You've seen the huge impact that you can make from a pollution perspective. Um, I made a QR code because as I was trying to create the fact sheet, it got longer and longer and so much of this is links to examples and links to, to forms that you fill out. So I made a QR code um, and I'll pass around those sheets if, if you wouldn't mind actually going ahead and passing those different sheets around. Go ahead and take a picture of that with your um, phone and it'll pull up the website that we have with all the information that I just described. If you don't have that capability on your phone, no problem. Just go to Coperg's website, and it's on our main website right now under the latest. You'll see a little article about this. But if you do the little QR code like a lot of restaurants are having you do with the menus and stuff, that should take you directly to the page that has links to all the different things that I just covered, um, examples of what other places have done, and, and the forms that you need to fill out, and the key steps that you need to take. I'll emphasize one more time when I've called solar installers and said, what would it take for you know, places of worship to do this? They emphasize time and time again, you need somebody who's really going to shepherd this through, whether it's an individual or a committee like you heard about here. You need that point person to make sure that they're shepherding this through because it, there are key decisions that any house of worship is going to need to make about whether it's solar and geothermal or just solar, or whatever it may be. So that's really, really key. And so I think everyone here and, and other folks back in your congregation are gonna be really important to be able to have somebody kind of leading that through. So I think that's all we were gonna cover overview wise. Um, and we can open it up for questions. And I'm wondering about solar gardens. Um, how, how do they get access to, to that, you know, um, to a solar garden? Our church already, I think, is purchasing uh, from some solar, I don't know where it is, but we're, we're, you know, participating in that. So can you speak to the solar garden and access to those? That's a great question. I don't believe there's a very detailed example of that in the federal, in the pages. I don't remember reading anything that says a, a place of worship can get 30% of the cost of installing a solar garden somewhere. This is where you might want to connect with your city or your utility because going back to some of the financing descriptions here, you might be able to put together a similar package where you can um, raise enough money to then purchase a solar garden or, or, or um, underwrite a solar garden and still have it kind of operate the way it was described here where you're paying your members instead of paying Excel or whatever utility it is. Um, I don't think it's explicitly called out in the federal direct pay. I'll do some digging and see if maybe purchasing something, I mean, the, the principle behind it is you're building more solar and then using that. So that might count, but might not. Um, I did not remember seeing that. Uh, we're looking at net zero, but I looked at solar gardens and I, I don't remember the details, but I concluded it wasn't appropriate for churches. That is for people who live in apartments, small apartments, and they don't have physically room to put a solar in, so they yeah. buy in. Absolutely, and, and there's just a bigger challenge, which is just financing more and more clean energy. So even if it's not for your particular community, there's certainly an opportunity for a green um, task force in a place of worship to put together a, 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 an investment in a local community to help them get solar as well. Um, I did forget as well, if you're in Denver, there's a city of Denver has a program where they'll pay 100% of the costs of major sustainability upgrades if you're a place of worship and you also hold a human service 
provider program. So there are uh, this last, in 2023, Denver um, upgraded, um, and I already forgot the name of it again, but a, a church that has a uh, human service program within it. And so that's a great program in Denver, and that's also on that QR code website resources on that. So if you're in the city of Denver, just because you don't have a program, though, doesn't mean you shouldn't go to your city council and call for it as well. These are really um, simple in the sort of political world of uh, you know thinking through, hey, if a city had a million dollars set aside, they could really help a bunch of houses of worship. So we should be advocating for that as well. Did so, you have another question? And then we'll yeah, go over. Well, I had a question. The, industri the uh, <coughs> Inflation Reduction Act, does it include conservation measures like insulation and uh, uh, LED lights and uh, that sort of thing. Yes, yeah, so I didn't. I did not see that listed out in their direct pay page. There is absolutely weatherization tax credits for individuals. So if you're a homeowner or renter, you can um, pull down a lot more dollars for a lot more things, including weatherization. There was no call out for a weatherization program for uh, places of worship, but again, there was listing. Geothermal, combined heat and power, a couple of, of other things. And then Can I uh, ask a question? You, yes. you mentioned geothermal, credit for geothermal, and then you quickly jumped over uh, um, angiothermal or something like that, and you just quick jumped past it, and so I didn't know what that was. No problem. So I said uh, geothermal, solar, and then combined heat and power. Is yeah, what's that? So combined heat and power is another, is a, it's a type of heating system. It's one where your, your heat and your power are run in the same, um, with the same equipment. I'm not a technological guru, but if you, when you, when I um, kind of Googled combined heat and power, it's not quite a heat pump, but it is, uh, you know, if you're doing a big retrofit of your, um, of your building, a combined heat and power um, system can oftentimes be more efficient than kind of the old gas furnace and then air conditioning system. So if you have those two systems combined, heat and power can combine those two, but it also, um, it's, it tends to be for larger facilities. That's when it tends to pencil out a little bit better money-wise. And it's called? Combined heat and power. Um, are they depending on people like you to kind of administer and explain this or are there certain offices in Denver where you can go and talk with people about this? Or how does, it's all online and you just, or how does this work? Yeah, uh, unfortunately there is no one like me that I know about from the federal government who's going around to places of worship making these presentations. So that's part of the impetus of our organizations coming together today to see if we can get some some content, some some you know a fact sheet together, a, a place on our website to tell stories of what they've done. A lot of the links that I have on my website are to the government sites. Um, I have not tried calling them up and trying to ask questions there, given the size of how much, given the size of these investments, hundreds of thousands of dollars. You certainly do want to work with a tax accountant, your, you know whoever your whoever does the taxes for your place because obviously these are technical and important and you want to get them right and I'm not a tax advisor. But yeah, I don't know of anyone who's out there doing this kind of education that we're trying to do today. We're hoping the information we provided to you today is clear and helpful and if it is, then we'll try to do more of it and if it's not, we get the feedback so we can improve this and try to get to more and more places. Now I'm specifically, for instance, I'm running for Westminster City Council and they're proposing a new municipal court building as well as um, a, a water treatment plant that, in my mind, well, they've been making these decisions in executive session, which is not right in the first place, but I'm really doubtful that the, the mu new municipal court building is planned in any way with regard to this kind of thing. And they're depending on bond financing um, but this takes it to a whole different level when you can depend on the government to finance this stuff rather than doing it through traditional bonds and stuff like that for municipal buildings and that kind of thing. Some municipal governments are also eligible for some of the direct payment credits that we talked about. And so it would be, I think, a missed opportunity. I've 
grave missed opportunity for any city right now to be investing in any new construction and not maximizing the opportunity to transition away, whether it's your fleet vehicles or your buildings or your lawn and garden equipment. I mean, there's just so much money out there to transition away. And so I think there was something was said earlier that really resonated with me, which is, you know, whenever you're working with a, a, a city or a church or whatever, and there's a committee put together to figure out how to do the construction of something, get somebody on there who can make that green sustainability pitch and ask those key questions. Sometimes that's all it takes and you can really start to see some green designs pencil out early in the process. It's a lot easier to do things right up front yes. than to retrofit it afterwards. And that's one reason why buildings are such a big carbon footprint right now is because we built them you know, poorly in terms of what's fueling them and heating them and powering them. And now we've got to, you know, the new buildings are easy and that pencils out, but the, the retrofits are much harder. And so it does seem like you should get in there and make the case, hey, let's not do a city building unless it's a green city building. Uh, on, on that note, many municipalities nowadays have, have uh, sustainability officers. Uh, that might be the case in Westminster or might not be. And those would uh, obviously be the first uh, people to uh, have to know all that stuff and inject it into the, into the discussion. So my, my, my question is, Milt mentioned uh, one of the uh, d dangers of going electric uh, which is these demand charges mm, uh, yeah. as you rise abo uh, above a certain uh, consumption level and even only for an hour uh, in one month um, you are faced with these very high charges. Uh, so my question here is are battery solutions uh, with solar also um, uh, funded under this program because they might be used to arbitrage um, and to dampen down your maximum use under that level. Battery storage is listed as one of the things you can get a direct pay assistance on. So that's definitely something you should consider. One other thing that your question reminds me of is um, always coordinate with your utility because there's oftentimes even more money out there from a utility. And it's also important to coordinate with your utility because um, I think the idea of the time of use fees, so again, as you mentioned, if you get above a certain amount, your bill goes way up. And I think the concept behind that policy was to try to disincentivize, you know, somebody who's just grossly using more energy than other folks like them. But there are entities like a church, or we saw it recently with RTD, our transit agency, where the, the design of the grid didn't take that into account. And so RTD, when they first went over into some electric buses, wound up having huge bills because the, the grid was reading it as if some giant energy hog was, was consuming all this energy. And they just needed to, re to change the time of use for buses because clearly buses are going to suck up a bunch of energy at once, but that doesn't mean we should disincentivize that. So always be coordinating with your utility so that they can help you design something to stay below that. Or we might need to advocate at the Public Utilities Commission to get them to create a specific time of use rate for larger buildings like a church to make sure you're not punished because you you didn't, you didn't suddenly become an energy hog, you just happened to be bigger than a home and based on the current um, uh, price system, it makes it seem like suddenly you became this giant home with a million Christmas lights or something when really you're just, you know, just a larger facility. So did you want to add anything because you, you dealt with this keeping under the 50? One question I did have uh, along the lines of storage was, uh, is there anything in the IRA related to what some people call vehicle to grid um, technology, bi-directional charging stations, or even charging stations in general? So char electric vehicle charging is another one where there's a lot of money for individuals to put in electric vehicle charging, but 
I didn't see anything around charging specifically in this direct pay category. Again, I mentioned electric vehicles. If you have a commercial vehicle, if, you, or if you're a church and you have some sort of, you categorize your, your transportation as a commercial, um, and I think there's a particular way you need to actually like, you know, you have to be categorized in that way. You can't just say you're a commercial operator or whatnot. And um, uh, I mean, you're now talking about federal subsidies, but there are state subsidies for uh, electric vehicle chargers that are available for anyone from HOAs or apartment blocks to um, businesses to churches. Uh, uh, there are some, some specifics. For instance, uh, if you just put in one, the other one has to be handicapped accessible, mm. um, but there are still subsidies out there up to $8,000, I believe. That's great, yeah. that's great. I was mostly just focused on IRA, so I'm, thank yeah. you, and I'd love to add that into our, our sheet there. Did you have another question? It, it goes back to what you said about getting the direct payment. You have to put the solar on or the geothermal in, and you probably have to pay for it with the contractor do we have any idea how long it takes for the federal government to do those direct payments? Because that's going to put a lot of churches in a bind. Now they're going to have to come up with 100% of the financing and have some kind of a bridge loan or whatever. So any idea about the timeline to get that, those payments? Like so many of these programs, when they're new, everybody's trying to figure them out. I theorize that some of these solar installers will see the opportunity to float the cost for, you know, of that 30% because they're, that money is going to come in. And so there could be opportunities for the businesses themselves, the solar installers themselves to, you know, kind of float that for six months and not, you know, and, and then they get the, the money back. But the, um, I can't tell you exactly how long it will take, but according to the the information that they provide, and just this year is the very first year tax-exempt entities are eligible. So whoever's putting in solar right now will submit, will add the, that will submit that cost when they file their taxes by April 2024, generally, and then they'll get a payment back from the federal government. Does that mean a month, two months, three months? I mean, as an average taxpayer, usually when I file in March, I get something back within a few weeks. It is unclear how long they'll take to analyze and evaluate this. We just haven't seen it yet because this is literally the first year you can be eligible. So there's no guarantee other than you'd have to surmise it probably would be a few months and then you'd get that assistant, that, that check in the mail, so to speak. Un unless there's another government shutdown. Yeah, so. I mean, the stability of our federal government. Uh, yeah. And I think there's w one specific thing that I learned about grants in, uh, in general, uh, where you need to uh, basically open up an account uh, with the government so you can get paid. And it's, uh, I'm not totally sure about this in this instance, but it's something um, to to observe. Often yeah. there are specific pathways to get paid, and yeah. unless you have that that account number, uh, nothing is going to happen. On the government's website, they go, "Here are your six steps," and I link to it in that QR code. And I think step four is submit something to the IRS saying this is coming, and they give you a number. They give you an account number. And so yes, there's some there's a step in there where you do need to create the way that they're going to send you. And the check. step is going to take time, so um, uh, do that as early as you can. Sure. Um, that would be one piece of advice. And you mentioned something else about floating those thirty percent that you are sure to get back. I know that one particular credit union uh, in the front range, I forgot what it's called. Um, is actually doing this with um, both commercial and private customers uh, who have these 30 percent coming. They give you a very low um, uh, interest rate on those 30 percent because they're guaranteed. Um, and they give you the regular commercial rate uh, for the remaining 70 percent. Sure. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. And uh, not all banks uh, operate that way, and you can save thousands of dollars uh, going that route. 
actually, there is a credit union here in the metro area called Clean Energy Credit Union. So that would be worth checking into. They might be jumping on this. So, and okay. that reminds me, there is a new green bank that the state is creating as well. The Colorado Clean Energy Fund, I think is what it's called. Again, it's on that QR code website. And that could be another entity that comes into the, the, the gap here and helps, helps fill it. Um, so anyways, yeah. Okay. Well, before we go on the tour, let's have Thomas do ah, the yeah. closing and a little uh, overview of Together Colorado. Thank you. Let's give it up for Danny. Thank, right. thank you, Danny. Coperg. Um, and I'll be brief, folks. Good evening. My name is Thomas Weiler. I'm a lead organizer with Together Colorado and have the pleasure of working with an amazing group of faith communities across the state. Louder? No. Too loud. <laughs> okay. Um, how was that? Um, including Tom and Karen and Janelle and Tony um, and, um, and, oh, anyway, Ann and Bill. I see you all. So, um, and... What the closing thing I'd like just to offer is that for, for me, the IRA is actually also this incredible organizing opportunity to base build an army of people who can get involved. And perhaps you're called to get involved at your faith community level to help you go green in your house of worship. Perhaps others, and we didn't cover the other aspects of this today, such as how in your home or in your apartment, you can actually encourage and organize and build a team of people in your apartment to get renters to go green and to push your landlord or in your homeowners association or in your home as an individual. Um, or perhaps it was mentioned at your city level or at your county level or your school district level. This is so unique. For so long, we've been having to look to, towards the Paris Accords or towards the federal government places that we as local people cannot have an impact on, now there is this incredible opportunity for 30% off the bat, and then there's so much more um, that we can also tap into. So if, I just want to invite anybody here today and anybody who's watching, think about how you can get involved, what is your level of involvement, and how can you educate more people and bring more people with you into the fight, because it's got to take more than just us. Um, and I think this example of the uh, First Uni Universalist today is such a great example of it because the folks who were in the weeds or who watched it or who gave a little money or a lot of money, you are now invested in the success and it, and it creates ownership, it creates buy-in. I mean, I'll tell you, I have a, the reason I do this work, I have a, a four-year-old and a one-year-old. My four-year-old, literally, when we drive around now, he's, like the thing he spots, his thing for the month is, there's solar panels on that house. Look at them. It's just like such a great opportunity for people, when, especially when an institution that is a, a, a trusted institution, um, like a church, like a synagogue, like a school, goes green. It gives people in the neighborhood something. To, it, uh, I think of it as a catal catalyst, right, that unlocks people. So there's an amazing opportunity. Whatever it is that you have a home or a community, how can you get people moving and accelerated? There's folks who have done amazing webinars on how you can do stuff locally. There's folks, we did a, a webinar last week on how we can, how, how you can organize at the local level at your city, county. So if you want to learn about that, we're learning how to even do it. Come talk to, uh, um, to me if you'd like more info. And then today, obviously, how can your house of worship also get moving and start to get into get into the thick of things? So uh, how's that? I miss anything? Um, and if folks want to hear more information, here to answer it. So thank you so much. And with that, I will hand it back to Tom. Thank you. Um, Tom, Thomas says that there's a lot of uh, information out there. Uh, and a lot of us are exchanging information. There are a lot of webinars. But in addition, keep in mind that, that the people that built this built it so that we could show it. So if you run into people that say, I don't know, will this really, really work? Just send them over. First Universus will find a way to give them a tour and show them that we not only build it, it turned it on, got it up to 80 degrees the first day, but by the second day on, it ran. We didn't change the oil for five years. Just call so, Bill. <laughs> so uh, come have other people come and get tours. Any other questions? What is your energy bill here? Is it zero? 
What was the energy? It's not zero. That's why we're going to round two. Milt will be able to tell you. <clears throat> well, the energy bill, uh, we, oh, let me back up. We did make the revenue neutral goal. In other words, uh, the amount that we had been paying Excel in the past was around $18,000 a year, I think. And correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but I think the payment to the members is somewhere in that same category. I think we came within $1,000 of meeting the revenue neutral goal. The problem was, as I alluded to earlier, that the facility turned out to be a success in the sense that people enjoyed being here. They liked uh, the fact that we were real close to net zero, but the activity level increased almost 20, 30 percent. So our energy usage went up, which means we still had to buy some power from Excel. So we bought $6,000 worth of electricity from Excel in um, 2019, the one year before COVID that we had um, a full operating year to look at the, uh, the total expense. So uh, I think, it, you know, this kind of a transition can be done and it can be done in a so-called revenue neutral w manner that Tom described. So, um, and, and just also, be alert to the fact that you may find that your facility then ends up getting used more than what you planned. And from a church perspective, doing what we did and what you're contemplating will really help you attract new members. Because what we're finding is young members really take a look at what is our carbon footprint, what are we doing for the environment, and it's really generating some, some awesome numbers for new young members, so take that into consideration as well.